Hey, if you've ever wanted to see a million million worlds, stalk the night fantastic, or hang out with beach bunny bimbos with blasters, then get ready because it's time for the Mythwits, the show dedicated to all things geek pop culture, drenched in absurdity, and coated with sarcasm. We bring you the news and interviews from the Geekoverse. We do our damnedest to be funny, but there are no guarantees. I'm your host, Peter Bryant, and joining me this week is my co-host, Mike Kafis. How you doing? <laughs> We're also joined this week by John Ryer. Hello. Robert Trav Pulaski. Hello. And Bruce Sheffer. Hello tonight. And uh, this this episode is is we're not we're gonna stay a little bit away from the funny. I mean, we're gonna have a little bit of fun, kind of like a, like a wake, uh, as, as I'm sure Richard would have liked. But we are celebrating the life of Richard DeHolka. Uh, he he passed away just this past week. Um, and if you don't know who he was, you're about to find out everything. But as a fan of this show, you should have heard his name, or at least the stuff that he's made a few dozen times. Uh, he was a writer, a game designer, a publisher. Uh, and he was best known for his work with the creation of the role-playing games Fringeworthy and Bureau 13, Stalk in the Night Fantastic. And he has done a lot more stuff than, than just that, I mean, by far. Uh, but those are the ones that you, if you have heard of him, uh, that's probably what you would have heard of. So, um, so I, my guests that are on tonight, I mean, other than Mike, Mike is a host. Hi, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> but my guess, the mm-hmm. other three uh, were were from the from the beginning uh, for the the uh, TriTac podcast. Um, uh, me and the guys had formed the TriTac podcast, uh, and then I got very busy with the TSR stuff and the fr- and uh, Mythwit stuff. And they had they had it well under control, so uh, they've been keeping it alive and kicking, uh, putting out an episode mm-hmm. every really we, week. We- didn't kick you off the show, Peter. I swear we didn't. <laughs> no, no, no. Hey, that, that's my, it's my show, and that was my gracious exit. No, <laughs> but um, even especially after I created a, a special intro, they included your name in it too. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> so, so before we go too much further, I just you know I just want to say that that um, you know Richard was a Richard was a cool guy. He was uh, you know I got, I'm glad I got to know him. Um, through uh, through working on the podcast and working with some from Fringeworthy stuff and uh, you know I met him at, at uh, Gen Con one year um, and, and guys do, does, do all you guys have a drink uh, any kind of drink whatsoever mm-hmm. anything glass of water or whatever really? doesn't matter um, yeah I do as a matter of fact <laughs> it's the the rum that he introduced me to that he got through working on Incursion too uh, so basically Coke uh, Newfoundland Screech rum. Sweet, sweet. Okay, excellent. So I don't want to belabor this too much. I just want to say, uh, here's to you, Richard. May yep. you may your Cheers. passing take you to happier pastures. May you be wandering the fringe path as we speak. Uh, yeah, clink. Stalking the fringe path, fantastic. <laughs> right, right. All right. So let me. Um, you know, I want to give mm-hmm. Bruce. I want to give you the mic first. I mean, you were out of okay. all of us, you knew Richard better than any any one of us. Um, mm-hmm. So why, why don't you tell us about Richard? Like, you know, like his early days, and and, and maybe get us take him take us right up to where he kind of got into TriTac. I mean, as far as you know. Okay. Well, actually, John Ryer was uh, in his early playtest group and probably knew him better back then. But um, okay. I can tell you that um, originally he was in a partnership. Uh, he and his wife. Um, was in a partnership with the Steins, um, and uh, they were called Tacky Tack Games back then. And mm-hmm. they produced a whole lot of what we would call, well, at the time, they called them beer and pretzel games. Now, I guess you'd call them casual games, or um, even today, they would be flash games on the computer. They were mm-hmm. small games that could be played. They were very absurd. Um, and uh, like, for example, um, Baby Boomer, where the job, what, where the goal of the game was for you to get the 357 Magnum away from the baby before the baby either shot you, Officer Dan, or pooped his diaper. <laughs> <laughs> There's an actual video game about that too now. It's a normal Tuesday yeah. for me. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, exactly. but there's a video game of this, uh, John. Yeah, in the same the same premise, where basically is, your goal is to keep the baby from killing himself. Oh, okay. (laughs) And and this was, you know, basically this was a little grid game. You know, you threw some dice and you, you, and literally you could pull it out of your pocket, you know, and, and play it, you know, and if it got dirty or messy, the things cost $2, you know, you, you could buy them, buy another copy, no problem. 
um, mm -hmm. and they sold, you know, they had a ton of these things. They had, um, uh, they, they had escape from Westfield State Mental Hospital. They had urban drive-by. They had um, war Ger on high. Oh, geriatric war? Geriatrics War, which is probably one of their most famous ones, uh, which is where you were an elderly person trying to, you know, fight your way to the bank to get your, the last check that was ever coming from the government, you know, for your retirement into the bank and had to fight the gangbangers and wild dogs and other other geriatric people who also wanted to 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 remove your your check from you with their canes and walkers. So yes. it was it was a very crazy nutty game. Uh, and and they were all like that, you know, and they were yeah. fun to play. And uh, he even had a series of them, uh, which was called the Duck Series. It was the Duck Trio. Polly oh, Wampus. Yeah. yeah, Polly Wampus, which was the duck from Three Mile Island, a gigantic, you know, vicious duck that was attacking Boy Scouts. Because you were Boy Scouts fighting the duck. Okay. And then they came out with Pterodactyl, which was an even larger, you know, Kaja sized duck flying around mm -hmm. and it exuded this anti um field around it that knocked out all the normal planes and so you had to get into these old time you know uh, biplanes and uh, uh mm -hmm. air light air guns and stuff and try to take a duck that was basically air traffic from mm -hmm. and then there was duck trooper uh, the, the the real, the real, supposedly real game, were wishes. Uh oh, wait a minute, Bruce uh -oh. is breaking up a little bit. Internet cut you off, Bruce. Yeah, <laughs> crap. All right, wait a minute. Hey, oh, he froze. All right, so John, uh, uh, Bruce, you there? Okay. Well, well, until we hear, until we hear Bruce's voice again, we'll go with John. <laughs> so, uh, John, right. you said that. Um, Said that Richard had met you, uh, or, or Bruce was saying there that you were playing in Richard's early uh, playtest. Oh, oh yeah, way back when. Uh, yeah, basically, I met Richard at, at one of the early Novacons. No, not Novacons. What was the the gaming convention they used to hold at the uh, University of uh, Oakland University? Yeah, I forget yeah, the yeah. name of that. Forget yeah. the name of that con. It's it's probably long gone. It, well, yeah, yes, well, maybe Michigan. Yeah, they had the two large. Uh, large dice they made out of vinyl and wood, which weighed a ton, but they, they had a pair of dice. And that's what I, I met them, him and Kevin Dockery. Uh, they were they were play testing Mario Project. Mario Project. Yes. Oh, there he is. Okay. Oh, there he is. Okay. Oh, okay. Hey, I'm on, I'm on the tablet now. Uh -oh. <laughs> Technology, we will not be stopped. Yeah, you need, <laughs> yeah, you need to plug into it, Bruce, because we're hearing you. We're hearing echoes, echoes, echoes. <laughs> And does this sound better now? There yes. we go. Yeah. There you are. Hey, yeah. well, while we, while we, uh, Bruce gets situated, let me let me just say I want to give uh, first. Let me give uh, Dave Morgan a shout out in the uh, chat room. Our chat room is really kind of jumping for um, mm. the ones, and uh, we got Sloth nineteen sixty three. Uh, so hey, Sloth, and then we just got another one, uh, Revo Revo. <laughs> Revo uh, the Eric, Revo hey Eric. <laughs> Eric. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And Paul McDonald, that's Sloth. So uh, we we'll just welcome guys, and we'll uh, we'll try and give you guys a little shout out of here now and then. Um, but you know, feel free to uh, talk amongst yourselves as well, and ask us questions, and sure. ask questions. Yeah, yeah. Right. But oops, who who you want to go back okay, to? John, what were you saying? We'll okay. Just finish up your thought real quick. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, I met you know, so I met him through that. Then I got introduced to the Order of Leibowitz, which was a uh, science fiction slash gaming group at, at the at the Oakland University, not the one in California, the one in Oakland County, Michigan. Got yeah. <laughs> got to do that because there actually are two Oakland universities, <laughs> right? Maybe more. And there's more than yeah. one uh, Order of uh, Leibowitz. Yeah, 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 but. Okay. Uh, but yeah, that's where we that's where we I start you know started playing games with Richard. Uh, we played some more Mario Project. I finally survived one when Richard ran the game. Kevin, uh, you gotta say Ke Kevin Dockery was ex Vietnam vet, and he had a tendency to run his games assuming with the assumption that a you a sixteen year old knew enough about military combat that you knew what, what the right thing was to do in, in a situation. And if you didn't do it, he'd kill you. <laughs> oh, 
So, yeah. so what was uh, real quick? Uh, what was what was Richard's role on Morrow Project? Because I know it's not a TriTech product, but I know he did he did work on it. Oh, right? he was he was the primary designer for oh, it. Okay. Yeah, it, okay. It, Kevin Dockery was more in the end of um, in the line of uh, providing information about military equipment and so forth. And there was actually it was a third person. Uh, Robert yep. Sadler. Yes, yes, Robert Sadler. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, he was also uh, he also helped with a lot of the uh, I would say uh, some of the game design and and color uh, okay. color text they provided, and yeah, it, they went and created Morrow Project, and we won't go into what happened to Morrow Project because that's right. entirely another podcast. Yeah, that's <laughs> a whole podcast in and of itself. All right, so and, so, and, and it's up for a re-release. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I already I got a copy of the new re- version. You still don't have an intelligence stat in the game. There you go. That's fine. You're as smart as you are. So, so Robert, where yeah. where did you meet? You you lived near uh, Rich, right? Oh yeah. Well, I mean, John comes from the Detroit area too. He just you know moved later. But yeah. Um, <laughs> actually, my now first ex wife, uh, Shelley's mom, she got me an autographed copy of Incursion at a local Detroit con in ninety two. And so that was my gateway game, Incursion. And then I just got all the other books. And I met Rich and I talked to him at, at cons and stuff. And I started reading all the various books, uh, all the 92 editions. So Bureau 13, Fringeworthy, FTL 2448, and Incursion. And what I started noticing. Kid. What? <laughs> so what a sweet kid. You came in so late. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> in 92. <laughs> yeah. Well, I young man. FTL. <laughs> oh no no i realized that out of the three of us myself i'm i'm always going to be the newbie i understand this i get it and i, you know, I know my role um but no i started noticing all these various things about the, the various facets of what i now call the tohoka verse and so i wrote hand wrote like 40 questions on line paper mailed it to him and he sent me this fat nasty manila envelope through of all these various arts and stuff about incursion and the lost races of FTL. And just so that was my beginning of my trip down this rabbit hole where, right. but he didn't actually answer your questions. Did he? <laughs> no, well, no, no, I no. answered a few of them. <laughs> no, <laughs> how did, how did you want to, and, and he remembered me and said, Oh yeah, you, and I, um, <laughs> I got involved. In, stop it. I got involved with all the, um, all the Yahoo yeah. group, everything and then mm-hmm. just he brought me rope and hold yeah. i think we and roped you in roped you into the uh fringe worthy ogl well first that and then after certain things changed with the bureau 13 ogl he asked me to head that and i'm like okay we've got graphic designers we've got you know technical writers like yeah, we've got computers but why me and rich said you love the game you're a fan Ah, right. And you were, and, and you were, and you were there and willing to work. Yeah. yeah. Well, I got a little behind, and John actually had to give me a good swift kick via email to get me going. And finally, I said, "Okay," and cranked it out. And we let's see, and, that and, came out. And Trav, I bet your, I bet your price was right. <laughs> oh, yeah. I have to use a comment though, because though it's, it's it's a nasty one because it came from Richard's ex, okay, uh, Kathy. Uh, Trav was his sub sub Chicano labor. Oh, okay. <laughs> really? <laughs> wow. <Yeah. laughs> so, Hey, so, we're all there, you know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. At least wow. Peter, at least Peter got paid for his work. No, no, I he did didn't. No. Oh, no, wow. No, no, I was no, but you know what? You know what, John, I, Rich had brought me so much joy. Dude, I'm telling you, we played Fringeworthy. It didn't matter what game we played. We were still playing Fringeworthy because we put the French pass in every goddamn thing we play. Oh, yeah. And, um, yeah. So, yeah. so Rich, Rich brought so much enjoyment to our lives over the years, you know, with his creations. And, and uh, you know, it was honestly, it was a pleasure for me to do, to do the work for him. And it was a real honor to, to get to design the cover for the, um, the, the D20 version of Fringeworthy. I mean, that to me, that was just like, that was, oh, oh. it was an honor. I mean, I just, I felt oh, no. fantastic. When I, when I first got into the podcast, the, the back then it was still the Fringeworthy podcast. Let's see, halfway through season two, me and Jay Haley joined up. 
first thing I did was congratulated Blix. I was just blown away what the stiffy did for Fringe for the D20. I'm just looking at this going, holy. And so I, I gave Blix his props right away. Out and yeah. Yeah. Oh, had to, was, was, hold on. I just, I got to get a shout out to the chat room because oh, yeah. everybody's um, uh, reciting the uh, Mushy Meller uh, poem. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> This has been something we've been doing too. That's awesome. Oh, I have to do this now then. Excuse right. me. Mushy Miller, funny fella, running midst the trees. Who's there? I says. I stood in my head, but nobody answered me. <laughs> yep. That has been, uh, that's except, been an old one. Except it's hiding midst the trees, but okay. Yeah, hiding midst <laughs> the trees, yeah. And uh, the second... Because the, ru the running is is what was uh, the, what happened after they found the Meller. Right. It was it was Mushy Meller, Funny Feller, running midst the trees. Who's yeah. there? I said as he bit off my head Good. and gurgled oh, gleefully. gleefully. Yep. <laughs> now, if you want me to, I can do the do it in the original Latin. No, that's no, okay. we're good. That's <laughs> At some point tonight, you're going to have to do the slarg, though. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> and if Joe, yeah, oh, God, so if Jay Haley was here to do the the fucking key gap, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah. I missed that. So, Peter, yeah. how did you meet Richard? Uh, okay, so, so I, um, I can't remember when it was. It was about a year, I think, about a year before we started the actual TriTech at the time, the Fringeworthy podcast. Um. I think I found you guys on a Yahoo group or something. I was looking around. I was like, there's got to be a Fringeworthy group somewhere, you know. Uh, and then I got involved. And then you guys were talking about maybe something about promoting it, kicking things off again, like like really starting to trying to put some kind of, of um, movement behind what was going on with Fringeworthy. And I said, why don't you start a podcast? And then uh, – Bruce, I think it was Bruce. I think you were like, "That's a good idea." When do we start? <laughs> I was like, "Yeah, that was me." Yeah, and yeah. I was like, "But the but the thing was is that I was ready to do a podcast. I was just looking for something to do. Like I wanted to do a podcast. I'd actually bought a mic to do it, and I was like preparing, like learning how it was all done. And I think it was Mike Cavis and I were talking about doing like a um, a skeptical podcast at the time, but there were a bunch of those, and I, I really didn't feel like we had like enough to add to that movement but then bruce when you were like when you were like let's do a fringe with the podcast like i could talk that all day every day so i was like let's do it so uh, because so it that, covers so many topics yeah it does it does and so so we did that for a while and then um and then yeah. you were, they were going to release the d20 um Fringeworthy, and uh, I said, "Well, I can contribute some art." So then I put together some art, and that's when I met Rich and and ta was talking to him, and mm -hmm. um. Uh, then I sent the artwork to him, and then I guess the, the you know then I eventually I met him at Gen Con. We all, that was at Gen Con that we all went to. We all agreed, hey, we're gonna you know we're gonna get, we're all gonna oh, that go. Was, um, 2012, yeah. I think. Uh, something like that. When all of us met, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Eleven. Yeah. 2012. Yeah. To well, look 2012 at was the last one that it was a, like a a big one. Yeah. 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 So then that's how I met Richard, you know, and of course he came on the podcast from time to time and, and you know, we talk and, and I emailed with him a little bit and, and, you know, I didn't know him nearly as much as you, not nearly as well as you guys did, but I mean, you know, I, yeah. you didn't really have to know him that well to like, to, to like him. He was just a genuinely oh. nice dude. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. oh yeah. That was back in the day when we were doing a podcast every week. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So how does that work now? You well, guys we're still real. Oh, oh, we're still releasing them every week. Yeah, we're yeah. just not we're doing them every them week. Every week. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you guys get like prices right now. You're filming like once a week and just letting them all like in five hours at a shot. And then yeah. no, 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 no. We yeah. cut them up into, into, into halves or thirds. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's what, that's what Mike is yeah. saying. You record five hours at a go and then chop <laughs> it up and release it every week. Oh, no. Five hours. No, because we start at 10. We'd be what? Three in the morning. No, no. no. <laughs> What do you mean you start at 10? You start at 6.30. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy for John. Yeah, it, yeah, it's really kind of crazy having people all over the country being hosts at the same time. Yeah. Uh, it's it, it, there, There's a, there, there's a definite, uh, you know, I really think that John should be the one really running the show by the end of the night because all of us are like, you know, Trav and I are on the last energy of the day. Oh, yeah, and John yeah. should be like ready to go, but, you know. It's not the worst it? one though. Is uh, it, I, I've done uh, I've done podcasts where the time difference is about twelve hours. Uh, oh, we've done that. Oh done yeah, that. yeah. The um, the po our podcast around the Sunday Skypers. Uh, one of our one of our regular GMs lives in Sweden. 
Yeah, we we did one. Uh, we did we interviewed a bunch of guys from down in Australia. But we really anyway, want. We, yeah. Anyway. Hey, yeah. let's get back to Rich. <laughs> so, yes. So then, so Absolutely. so Rich Rich starts. He, you know, he started TriTech, right? And what was his what was his first game? Was it was it the um the Tiki the, what was it the Tiki nope. Tech? No, no. No, Tri Tech, the Techie Tech games was the games he started after after Timeline Games. Uh, he he um, left Timeline Games. Okay. And then okay. he and then he started Techie Tech games uh, right. with with Geriatric War was the first one followed by. Was there Monster Smash? Wasn't that an early one? Yes, that actually was a Mon- popular one. Monster, Monster Squash. S- yeah. Squash, Monster Squash. Monster Squash. Right. Tank Squash. Tank squash. I mean, yeah. actually, those things are entirely viable these days. I, I, we probably should, you know, do a re- recast of those and re-release them as, as I don't know, super squash. I don't know. <laughs> well, they're all together in one PDF, so I don't know what yeah. else we need to do with them. Yeah. Is that basic? Now, how does that work? Do you basically you build like a uh, like a clay creature and you smash it with your fist or something? Wasn't that basic? Wasn't it pretty simple? You rip off you know, with mantra squash. You'd rip off arms and legs and heads until they, until it lost all those hit points. I see. You know, okay. So we do oh, damage. Like black knife. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, the monsters would fight each other, and so you know, and they would have various types of weaponry depending upon how you rolled on a table, and as you tore off the various appendages that were that were being attacked uh then they would lose hit points and when they finally lost all of their life points then you then if you were at a convention you pulled out a huge ma- wooden mallet and just slammed it down on top of it turning it into a pancake on the surface of the table right yeah that's because some people would use toothpicks to stiffen them oh oh oh, <laughs> oh. You smash it with your hand <laughs> yeah. hey it's not safe for work right yeah, <laughs> dick move, <laughs> right? Dick move. Yeah, 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 yeah. But you know, th- there's no way to get that sword to stick up the way you know the way you need it to, unless you put a toothpick in there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what was what was Rich's first like kind of big game, like his first main game? Was it Fringeworthy or was it Bureau Thirteen? Yes. Uh, well, it was no, yes. Fringeworthy. No, it, it was, was FTL. It was, was it FTL. FTL was his FTL was his first game he did. He okay. Well, it wasn't he, the first. It wasn't the first one released, John. You're right. It wasn't, but it was the first one he play tested, though. That's when he actually okay. put a lot of a lot of. Uh-huh. We we okay. played into that for like two, three years. Actually, three, okay. f- three, four years. So they actually had the longer the longest play test. Right. Make, so but, but also it was the last one released too, because it, obviously yeah. it was more complex. Okay, so in other words, he started with that one, and there was so much work and everything that had to be done on it. He. Just like a regular game designer with with massive ADD, <laughs> went on to something else before he finished that one and put yeah. that out. Okay, but well, remember was the first there, one. he had partners. Yes. Yeah. Yes. He had partners, so oh, you know each okay. of them had had a different focus, and uh, that and and the uh, Steins really liked uh, the um, uh, uh, the FTL twenty four forty eight. They really thought that was the future, and uh, after and Richard later on became convinced that it was. That Bureau Thirteen was going to be the big seller for the company, uh, and it turned out he was right. He was right. Uh, yeah. So, so you had like three products that were all basically coming out within a few years of each other uh, because they were they had all di- you know, different people in the company were all working on different things. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Walt was yeah, saying. I never, I never knew that. David, for... I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was saying that <laughs> Walt was saying that FTL was first, and that Chris was taking too long making the star charts. So that's I think that's why. <laughs> okay. Oh yeah, the star charts, I and mean, unfortunately, they need to be completely redone because because thanks to Hippocaros, they're wrong. Hippocaros. Uh, we discussed this on a previous. Yeah, podcast. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, but yeah but yeah uh, yeah it was uh, Fringeworthy was first. I I, I just got the play test in that one. Uh, I w- uh, was the first person to kill a Miller. Nice. Really? Well, I mean, you're yes. the first person ever to kill a Miller. Yes, with a blunderbuss. Sweet. With a pl- that's, a hell of a, <laughs> that's a hell of a claim. Yeah, yeah, but uh, now that was actually back when fringe worthiness wasn't a thing. You basically, we were uh, the kid premise in this one because it was we were we were we were from Morrow Project. Mm. We were we were taken out. We were defrosted and and basically said, "Here, go through this thing because the last team didn't come back." Uh, I see. Okay. <laughs> and it was. So I'm just saying. Yeah, it was it was more. Uh, it, it's a saying I would call the dark fringe. 
Okay. Basically, it's it's more like the uh, show we sh- we shall not name with the big ring. Right. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> anyone could go through at the time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. And then it, right. it changed, uh, and it changed, and it changed, and it changed. The alley of the fringe pass, you know. <laughs> yeah. Hey, yeah. Cause... That's that's what happens when you design games. You know, I mean, you 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 design it, and then you it, the yeah. rubber hits the road, and you go, shit, that didn't work. And then yeah. there's a there's a whole lot of <laughs> shit that didn't work. It worked here, like it was working. I'm telling yeah. you, it was the coolest thing I, I yeah, ever imagined. Thing, it sounded better in my head, didn't it? Yeah. 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 And then as soon as the well, dice, we have the, a, <laughs> what's that, Bruce? We have a term for that, Peter. It's called emergent play. <laughs> <laughs> now I have to say something about 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 that. Richard Hoka designed many games with a lot of the same systems or different systems, but they never were the system he played. He ran. It was the Richard RPG inside his head. Oh, hey. He, I, he, he, you played in a game of his? Yep. Didn't you? It I was think not. I didn't. It was it, it was, was it wasn't one when he published, was it? It was the game in his head. Yeah. And I know I know Melody was working on that game. His wife, Melody Natcher. She mm-hmm. was she's been working on that game. Richard's game. Richard's RPG. She was, she's been try, she she's been trying to make it come true. Right. <laughs> Yeah, for the yeah, past hey, couple of years, she's been working on that particular system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hey, we got we got a guy in the chat room, um, uh, Sloth, nineteen sixty three, and he asked a good question, and he and he's right, and we've talked about this before. We talked about this on the podcast a lot, um, and and his question is why did Tremellan walk? And I think we we've, we've said before that they they we don't think that they did. No, right? They probably didn't walk. I mean, they they could go. They could use, you know, there's a subway thing. He knows about that, and everybody knows about that by now. If you listen to the TriTac podcast, you would know this. Um, but you could put two of the crystals together, and you could summon a summon a subway car. But mm-hmm. as we've said before, that you know, those are like the maintenance tunnels. I mean, in con- they're the right. Jeffrey tubes. In in Jeffrey's in, tubes, yeah. In concept, they they can just go from one portal to another, right? I mean, they could just walk in oh, one no, and no, walk no, out no. another world. When the big system was operational, yeah. Uh, basically, you said, "Oh, I need to go here," and you're right. there. Right. Yeah. There was those those tunnels weren't used at all. Yeah. No. They basically they were more used for finding new places, and basically they were more used by their scouts, aka the Meller, the old Meller. I yeah. see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They they were used um, to basically reach the worlds which were not officially in contact with the mm-hmm. uh, with the rest of the fringe pass. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> Because you wouldn't want your average Joe Blow in the Commonwealth suddenly deciding to pop in on a world that was considered off limits because they couldn't stand to have aliens there. So mm-hmm. you, you know you'd have some way of buffering them and keeping them, uh, you know, out of the mainstreams, and that was one of the ways of doing it. Right. Yeah. Be, be, What's basically up, the big. Oh, go ahead, oh. Mike. No. Well. I'm just, uh, there was something somebody said that they were talking about riding bicycles on the fringe pass. And we used to, there was all kinds of iterations we used to do, but didn't we do a cheat in a workaround? I was just wondering, we found some way, and I can't remember exactly where we could we we fashioned a, some sort of a non-electrical, uh, what do we do? Cold fusion engines or some kind of weird crap where we could still, still be electrical. Still be electrical. No, it, I think it, it, over I, cheat on that or were we okay we on that? We did one thing and, and this isn't, against canon um it's it's kind of like it, it wasn't released in the games or anything like that but we we did something where we had biological engines where they basically it was like a bacteria that grew in a tank and we siphoned off the electricity from that because it didn't stop electricity in living beings uh but i think the the game master said he wouldn't we couldn't go over a certain speed we couldn't generate a certain amount of electricity or else the system would recognize it so we could only use so much or something i don't know that's what we did we're lazy. We just. But that's, we, we that's not canon. Oh. That's not even yeah. remotely canon, though. That was just some shit oh, that we did. <laughs> Use the one thing that, that Bruce came up with in his um, steam infinite, power. Infinite no infinite portals. Oh. He took took advantage of the gravity shear on the on the fringe paths. And yeah. I kept looking at I kept looking at it going, no, that shouldn't work. Right. That's right. that's perpetual motion. No, but, when you, once you look at it, you realize no, it's not perpetual motion. No, because the fringe paths put the energy in. Yeah, and you have to, and you have to also assume that when you start pulling work from that, it's going to slow down. So right. you have to you know, have a flywheel to spin up, right, and you right. we pull from the flywheel and not from this method of basically for you know using the gravity shear to to rotate a, a cylinder to generate right. uh, work. All right, well, hey, I got to keep this train on the track because this yeah, is yeah. a live show. So, uh, <laughs> no. 
really trying to derail. Come on. Yeah. So let's let's what uh, gamers going off on a tangent? Yeah, yeah. I know. Well, that that's why I'm the conductor here. So anyway, so so then so he so we released he released Fringeworthy. And he released it in that Combound. Like, I remember the Combound book, because that's the first one we had, that the blue Let me get my copy. The... Yeah, yeah go I ahead. got it. <laughs> <laughs> Trav's got one quicker. Right. I don't know. Well, they, were, they were originally uh, released, uh, basically saddle-stapled. Mm. No, that, that's, no, actually, that's actually the, that's the second edition right there. Yes, oh, okay. yes. First edition, uh, similar cover, only was in silver. Silver, Okay. And, and when you say saddle stitch, it was like pages laid out, stitched in the middle, and folded over. Yeah, like a magazine. Yeah. Okay, like a magazine. Okay. Yeah, no. it was basically you had you had you had the staples on the spine, and and it was held together. I mean, you know, and yeah. and uh, then they came out with a uh, metal spiral bound, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, like your old style uh, flip over. Um, uh, things that you take notes in and then right. he came out with a comb ba- base that you're seeing that you just showed well the metal one you're talking about is ftl ftl well, actually wasn't metal based it was plastic it was a plastic uh loop system well yeah, fdl had an actual binder that everything was yeah. in and here's an interesting little bit of a topic according to richard it was printed upside down basically if you if the typically where you would assume that the the the, the clips and the binders would uncut come off on on the wrong side Right. Oh God. So right, basically, so, hey, I have a I have a question. So so yeah, watching the video. So Bruce, he, he sent you. So uh, oh, uh, Richard video, sent you, yes. Richard, Richard sent you a funny video. Um, you should and, you should edit that, edit that in. He was yeah. he was totally serious about it until the end. Right. Right. <laughs> and it was it was a it was like a graphic artist video, like how to how to put together your own like magazine or whatever, any kind of right. like publication at oh, the time God, yes. using like light tables and, and, and razor blades. Uh-huh. And uh, and it was really right. cool because it takes me back to my old drafting days. We used to do that in, in drafting. You know, you do a drawing and if you had to replace a whole section, you could literally put it on a light table and cut it out and tape in a new piece and then send it to the blueprint machine and it would be fine. Um, so uh, the question that came to my mind is so. How did Richard do all this? Was this like out of his basement? Did he do everything like in his basement, um, like and, and put it all together by hand, and then and yes, the, and, and then what? And exactly then what? the way you saw it. And then he would take it. And to then what like, would happen is he, yeah, he'd take it to a printer. He'd take okay. it to an actual printer, and they would take those pages and they would create um, uh, eight. Basically, there'd be eight on a sheet. Uh, just like in regular printing, okay, and then they run it through these things called web printers, uh, and they would print them all out, and then they would take them and they would cut them and bind them, and um, and that's how you got them. Now, the the, the ones that were spiral bound, he actually ran that through a photocopier. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, okay, the- and that's how he made them. He basically you know, punched them and put the bind, uh, put the the things in them, and I had to do that too. All of the supplements like. Um, like uh, the DM's book of nasty tricks, or um, yeah, mm-hmm. and, and those other ones. Those were all like, spiral rogue. bound, and and you have to you have to punch them. You have to basically photocopy them. You have to punch mm-hmm. them. You got to put the, the the comb in there, and then you put them in a baggie and sell them. Yeah. There was like a yeah, there was like a punch. You would punch it, and then you would lift it up, take it out, and then you'd put the comb in and put the arm the other way, right? And then put it on the comb, and then close the comb, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. There was a special. There was a special machine that would first punch the holes, and then you would, and then you'd go and put them on. It'd hold it open, and you could put them all, uh, each each of the pages, set of pages. You put them on. And they'd be like drooping on the end, and then you just roll this this last lever, and it would roll it inside, and it'd be done. Yeah. Oh, it was. Uh, oh yeah. It, it was a very, very professional piece of equipment used by uh, publishing houses all over the world, and of course, <laughs> you could also use them. For free, you know, down at your local, um, um, uh, you know, uh, photocopy store. I don't know if Richard has kept the original blue boards because the ver- the first ones were done on blue board. The blue, the old blue board for laying outs and all that stuff. So you get all the uh, lines and everything cut to it. I don't know if he ever kept those or not. Those original mm-hmm. blue boards. So, so I got a guy. You'll have to ask the, Melody. Yeah. I got a guy in the chat room, uh, Sloth 1963. And he says, he's, you know, talking about this right about that time. He says, yep, with slaves, period. Us, period. That's <laughs> <laughs> funny. Yeah. But, but, but see, this was a night. Uh, he sent me that, uh, that video in ni- 1992. 
That was okay. when I was I when I started up Outpost Games, which was uh, a company solely for the purpose of producing professional supplements for uh, TriTac Games, especially Bureau 13, which was the biggest seller at the time. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, you know, as I, I said that this is the best way of promoting Richard uh, was to produce more things for people to play. I mean, they've got the books, but they don't have any adventures. They apparently don't know how to write adventures. So I will get, you know, uh, good writers and good art and hand it to them and they'll be able to play it. And Bureau 13 will go off like gangbusters. And when I told Richard this, he said, OK, fine, I'll show you how to do it. And that's when he sent me the video. Right. And at the end of the video, like, you know, it's funny. Because the video is all serious, you know. He, Richard's going through and he's and he's telling Bruce how to do all this and he's showing him. It's really well done, actually. And then right at the end, he says, it's "You have to be careful with you have to be careful with the razors." And blood starts shooting out of his finger, right? And it was really very well done. Like, like he, it, yeah. I'm telling you, it looked yeah. real. Like he really did. It wasn't fake looking. And blood is just pouring yeah. out and like pooling on the table. And he's like. <laughs> And he tells the cameraman, he's like, he's like, oh, turn that. And the camera goes off. And but you can still hear him talking. And he's like, he's like, oh, uh, we got to go. <laughs> but it was fake. It was real. No, it was oh, fake. No. It was totally it was totally fake. Oh, it was totally staged. It was That's totally funny. staged. Richard had a very, had a huge dramatic streak to him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he looks oh, so yeah. young in that video, too. You know, because I've only seen him with the gray, oh, it's you know, been 30 years ago. Oh, yeah. I, I know. I know. It happens to all of us. Right. So, What's that, Sonny? <laughs> hey, John, Does you're looking a little know? white. <laughs> Does anybody know the early years of Richard? I mean, like, what did he do from high school? Did he? What was his yeah. first job? Do we have any kind of information like that? I'm. I looked no. up on, on his uh, wiki, but there's not much really. Well, he was in the his... military, right? I thought he. No, was. he wasn't. No, he wasn't. Oh. Uh, no, no. no. What's that, that picture? Was Kevin him? Dockery. Duped oh. again. Oh, oh yeah. Have, okay. No. He, he right. knew he knew people. Richard okay. knew people, and he you know, and he got to go places that normal people never got. He got to go. Uh, so so he uh, is sitting in that tank. Oh yeah, I mean he knew. I bet if he I bet if he had a passport and went to Russia, he probably would have been defeated by folks in the Russian military. He got riding a, riding a T seventy two or something like that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> is, is that a tank or is that a coastal field piece? You know, I don't know. I don't know. I, I was looking at that picture, um, and it looked like he was in the military, so I threw it in. A, it's in the window. It's in the cycling window. Yeah, that, the that's definitely was not. He, he was not in the military when that picture was taken. Okay. No. Somebody, 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 had hairdo. somebody in the chat room was saying he's got a, a lot of really cool things in his – he had a lot of really cool things in his basement. He had a piece of Trinitite from um, the, uh, the first A-bomb that went off. Yeah, uh, I said it to him. He just had a lot of cool things. You sent it to him? Oh, okay. Oh, oh yeah. I got to yeah. visit Trinity. So, yeah, I picked up some stuff and sent him a, a coffee can full. You know, uh, basically, I, I took a small coffee can, put the Trinity in there, packed it well, then wrapped it in foil, 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 put another coffee can, wrapped it. And wrapped it in foil and wrapped it in foil, then taped it up and then wrapped it in paper and then put on danger radioactive and sent it to him. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, technically, it is radioactive. Oh, God, John. Yeah. It's well, technically, sure. I mean, all you need is a sheet of glass. You're, you're fine. Just put it in a lead <laughs> box. I mean, you know. No, sheet of glass, piece of paper. <laughs> is this just, just uh, alpha radiation? Right. Paper yeah. stops that. I mean <laughs> I mean, if you amount of radiation, you know, what you do is move from your ha your your nice uh, brick house into a nice A-frame that's made out of wood, and you will lower your radiation. People are getting yeah. radiated all the time. And oh, don't yeah. eat bananas. You get more radiation out of bananas. That's true. <laughs> all right, so, well, so I'm going to start wrapping them in foil. <laughs> So, so Rich had, you know, he, he did a bunch of games and, and we've talked about the big ones, you know, Fringe Worthy and Bureau 13 and, and Trav, mm -hmm. you did a lot of work on Bureau 13 for him. Um, oh, yeah. And so let's touch on Bureau 13 just a little bit, just because I think, Bruce, I think you're right. I think that was probably his most popular, maybe, probably, I w if I had to guess, it probably was most, most profitable. Most copied. Yeah. <laughs> most copied. It was a fun game. I, I remember playing it. I thought I had a great time with it. So, Trav, what did you, what did you wind up doing with uh, Rich on that? Uh, what it was is that I offered a lot of what they call fluff text. I wrote a lot of this because, oh, God. Oh, 2003, 4, 5, 6, I wrote a lot of what they would call fan fiction, which created 
Team Candlestick, the official Michigan team for Bureau 13, which basically it was me and my friends and my wife at the time. And I just wrote up these stories and I decided to transplant bits and pieces into this Bureau 13 OGL. I also, and this was the thing that got me, consolidated all of the timelines from all the Bureau 13 products that they had at the time. Right. That was not easy. <laughs> right. And yeah. then Richard was and, was a was a big fan of revisionism. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of big retconning. On, big on the retcon, right? So I was yeah. I was gonna this this brings up a, this is a good uh segue into um one of one of the other gentlemen that's no, no longer with us, which you know, I kinda he was part of the the, the you know the TriTac family in, in another direction, uh, was Nick Pallotta. Um and he you know, right. he passed away several years ago. Um, yeah. And, you know, it's funny. I never met him. I didn't know anything about him. And you guys, you talked about him a little bit. And, yeah. um, you know, he apparently he wrote a bunch of books for uh, for TriTac stuff. Oh, yeah. He wrote, he wrote four. Yep. Okay. Uh, just yep. just four? Just because I saw a bunch of covers. Were there different covers on some of the books? Yeah. Or? Yeah. Well, there, was yeah the, 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 one, there was a fifth one sort of in the works when, unfortunately, Nick passed. Okay. Yeah. And he also was in the process of, well, de them. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. I see. Well, it was a variant timeline, anyways. I think. Yeah. It, I don't, yeah. It was kind of his own take on Bureau. Thir- yeah. I mean, there were great books. Yeah. The, now, did he do a? Did he do a um, Bureau Thirteen game, like a different version? He did. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's called the Bureau Thirteen Special Edition, and it can okay. be purchased. <laughs> okay. All right, well, that's, cool. that's not the version I have. I happen to have one of only two copies of the of the version of d20 he wanted to do oh wow okay yeah yeah it, they'll never see lab day <laughs> uh, it is what it is. but, but oh, I, 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 yeah. yeah yeah i saw I, that copy at a confusion yeah. and i'm 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 just like wet hens weren't as mad as i was because <laughs> I can handle stuff. i'm like what the hell did he do? I was oh I and i yeah i kind of slammed it down on the counter at rich's table there and yeah, yeah. Then, but, I, I, but I played with him. I actually he he lived in Seattle for a couple of years, and I actually played his game with uh, Phil Fagio and his and his uh, girlfriend Kaya, and with James Ernest and his and his what and his wife uh, whose name I've forgotten. Sorry. Uh, know, and we and, and we were team tuna fish. I need to know who is. Okay, Sloth? yeah. <laughs> it's Paul Sloth? McDonald. His name is Paul, Paul McDonald. McDonald. Okay, Paul. Okay, I keep going. Oh, so yeah, Paul- we, I know Paul. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. So Paul's yeah. in the chat room. So he, apparently he did a lot of work with Rich because uh, mm-hmm. he's 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 like, yeah, I did this, and I knew this, and I did that, and Rich did this. I'm like, yeah. wow, you knew Rich well. Yeah. Um, I got you. Well, and, 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 Paul's local, so yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. Right. But, but but Nick Pilato, yeah, he, 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 like Richard, ran his own version of Bureau 13, uh, which did, did not at all match the rules uh, oh, or, yeah. and, and, and or things. I mean, Kaya was, Kaya's character was a genie with a bosoms of holding. Oh, nice. Oh. Okay, fantastic. You can could, you could feel <laughs> a battleship between them. Right. <laughs> so it's like Tim Anderson. You get six yeah. wishes. No, I'm, I'm just going to shut up. Okay, right. <laughs> Good idea. Yeah. So, and then, and then we also, uh, unfortunately, we also uh, a couple of years ago, we lost another uh, member of the TriTech family was Terry Williams. Mm-hmm. Um, right. Now, I I barely knew him. I think I, I think I met him at Gen Con. Was he at Gen Con the one year? Yeah. Yeah, he, okay. he, 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 yeah I think he was. Yeah. He was a good friend of Richard. He also was the closest person I would say was TriTech staff. Okay. He wasn't a designer. Yeah. He was more like the staff person. You know, he made he made things. He helped Richard make things. He was professionally, well, semi-professionally, was a maker of uh, fine wood uh, ink pens. Okay. You know, they That's were really, really, oh yeah, really nice, really Harry nice stuff. Was, Harry was also the maker of Rich's Richard Melody's wedding cake, <laughs> and it was basically that of a UFO landing, and there were little miniature cows, and there was the UFO because. <laughs> That is where Bruce and John and I officially met was at Rich's wedding got seven years mm-hmm. ago now. Yep. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, that cake was fantastic. Terry just did a wonderful job on that. Mm-hmm. It's like, it doesn't have cows like being lifted up into the spaceship or something. Right. Yeah. yeah. And they were, 
Yeah. 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 And little gray aliens. They found the gray alien set and they had the gray aliens on the cake and all. So it was great. I well, mean, the aliens were it. having a, the aliens were having a shootout with each other on the cake. I mean, it yeah. was a very yeah. exciting <laughs> scene. There was a lot of stuff going on on that cake. Yep. Now, <laughs> what, was there a wedding? So he, you know, he, he and Melody got married. Um, you said seven years ago. Did they get married at a convention or was it in a, a special a con- event? Confusion, yes. Yep. Conf- okay. Yes, confusion, which is in like third week of January here in the Detroit area. It's sort of our okay. mm-hmm. one of our sci fi media cons, would be yeah, the best okay. way to describe it. And I wish they had told me they were doing a sword, a sword arch because I would have brought my sword. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, getting it on the airplane yeah, would have been interesting. Really well. Yeah. 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 Well, no, no. I, I would, actually, I would go out and get myself a gun case and put it in a gun case. Just, yeah, you check it. Just check it. It's not that yeah. hard. Yeah, you check it. Yeah, in a gun case, and that's fine. Right. All right. So, so, and then, so we got a, you know, Rich did a bunch of games. I mean, we, we're we're talking about the big ones, you know, but he also did, you know, the Tritech did a bunch of games. There was Beach Bunny Bimbos with Blasters, which was a, a fun little game that they did. Um, mm-hmm. And then Hardwired Hinterland, which doesn't get, as far as I'm concerned, doesn't get enough. I don't have enough traction. It's a really cool game. It's a very, very cool concept. Um, mm-hmm. I actually ran in one of the adventures, uh, one of the cons I ran. I After we did a show on it, so we did a, one of the podcasts on it, and I was like, oh, this is actually really cool. I could, I could totally do an adventure for this. So I actually ran, I think I ran that at Gen Con. I think that's what I ran at Gen Con for, for TriTac. Uh, yeah. it was, I, uh, I ran was, a whole campaign of it, Peter. Yeah, no, I'm yeah. saying, yeah, it's it's great. Oh, um, I, and, yeah, I ran solo games of it too for the Sunday Skypers. Yeah, we had a great time with that. Yeah. And so I'm like, you know, what I want to say to anyone who's who might even be remotely familiar with his stuff and is thinking, you know, what, maybe I would like to try some of try tech stuff again. Don't overlook Hardwire Hinterland. It's actually it's a really cool setting. It's very very interesting. And I mean, you can mm-hmm. honestly, you could totally keep that system list run it with any system you want to run it with because be, it's very but easy to it was released that way it was released systemless oh was yeah. it? okay all right, all right so it is t- it is I, systemless i think it was one of the first ones he did systemless okay because i think it i ran was. it with savage worlds yes it and was it worked out great. yeah yeah i think you no know, he was play testing a new rule system at the time and uh he decided to, to do what every good game designer should do blind play test it oh yeah yep yep and he sent out to me, and I got my friends together, and we took it, and we we sent back. I, I think it was like 50, 60 pages for the rules. We sent oh, back wow. two hundred. We sent back two hundred and ten pages of critique. Oh God! Yeah. <laughs> there was there was more more critique than there were rules. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and and we and we were the t- play test team that made him cry. Oh. <laughs> oh. But, but then and that's when he another- said. That's what he decided to do systemless. Right, right. <laughs> well, another cool one was uh, was was Weird Zone, uh, and I've never played mm-hmm. that one, but 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 it's mm-hmm. such a good idea. You know, oh, yeah. you you basically uh, you're on this you're on this piece of land that just disappears one day and goes off into you know into this mm-hmm. space tunnel thing, uh, like the, where it goes to weird space. Um, you're and you're, lands- in, you're like an island. You're like an yeah. island floating through space, and yeah. your yeah. island has your house on it. Right. And mm-hmm. it's, it's a lot like apartment complex or whatever you're flying whatever you were in. You might have been in a gas station when it happened. Mm-hmm. But what's what's cool about it is, is that it goes to different goes to all these different places. Goes in, it's multi genre or whatever. You can go anywhere. Uh, you can run into shit while you're floating through the the, the easy space because you're hurling more, through. It's the easy more space. fun to to run into stuff in, in weird space than actually most of the worlds you go to. It is yeah. such a weird place that uh, <laughs> we. You know, I, I I I ran an adventure at last Gen Con, I think, where we literally had pirates fighting each other. You know, uh, they were they were you know one one zero plot home was was attacking another and trying to take all their stuff, and we had to do all that. That was that was a lot of fun. Oh yeah, right. I I, I also ran that for the uh, uh, Sony Scarpers, so we did never publish those. So I w- wish we would, but we didn't. But that was fun. I, uh, that's why I introduced the concept of, you know, you can make your plot bigger if you work at it. Just keep collecting dirt and throwing it on there? Or? No, you, you push okay. it apart. You cut a hole through it and you push it apart. Oh, I see. Okay. All right. And then you fill, you fill in the hole. And it, yeah. it, it keeps getting bigger and bigger. They, ran, uh, they, they, got, they heard word of one that was a mile across. Okay. <laughs> oh, it's in a hole in a bucket. They're alive. <laughs> yeah. They're that too. <laughs> <laughs> so... So then he, you know, and then he had, uh, he had other games like, and, and these were, 
these are more like settings, I think. Like her, her addict, her, oh, I got what you oh, say this. Her Radicator, that's it. Which is basically yeah. just, um, it's in the future and the the robots are killing people pretty much. Is that if I'm yeah. 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 Okay. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and then there was yeah, holes. It's, it's, it's it's human eradicator. Heradicator. Human eradicator. Right, right. Eradicator. Right. Uh, yeah. And then there was there was holes. What is holes? I'm not familiar with that one. Uh, it's like, you know, those. Uh, it's an RPG, but it's also a miniature game. Um, you're playing a squad, and you're basically going down. Basically, it's sort of like um, Space Hulk. If you're okay. if you heard of that, I've heard uh, of it, but I've never played Space Hulk. Uh, that or any of the uh, basically it's in the sense it's a it's a it's a uh, the, the games that are closest to it are things like uh, betrayal betrayal house on the hill where you're building the map as you go along okay so okay. basically it's 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 an rpg you're fighting uh, things coming out of the holes you know monsters from other dimensions i mean almost like duke nukem in a way okay. as, as well you know and you're building the map as you go along so it's I- it's a bit more random and he had he had Easy Space, and I know he was working mm-hmm. on it. Did he release Easy Space? Did that get released? Yes, he did. Yes, okay. he did. Yeah. So yep. he did finish that. Yep, where he had right. uh, we, Robert Heinlein as President of the United States. Okay. Yep. That helped us all. <laughs> yep. Yeah. E- easy Sp- the concept behind Easy Space was had a number of discoveries that was based upon uh, research those that had crashed in Roswell. Okay. Mm. And so they were set, and and the, and the basically the cat got out of the bag, and people started actually saying, "Okay, let's let's go ahead and 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 build ships and go to other worlds." And it turned out to be really easy because the information because the information on how to do it was available, and the and the drives and everything could be made with the, and anybody who had like a even close to a machine shop in their home, they could so produce. basically they they took the stuff from Roswell and made it open source. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 It's, it's a zero rust game. It's a rocket punk game, basically. Yeah. 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 It's it's basically, you know, your your next door neighbor is bu- busy building himself a space a space uh, cruiser in the backyard. You know. Right. From, from I think it wasn't parts. the idea basically the future as seen from the past or basic you know one of those yeah. kind of deals. Forties and fifties sci fi. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. You know the right. pointy upright rockets. Those type of. You know, yeah, you weren't yeah, in a it, you weren't in a space. It was you definitely was in a rocket history. ship. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it was truly a rocket. It landed on its butt like God and Heinlein intended. Yeah, right. And one that's, of the a, people, that's a direct quote from Richard. Yeah, right. And <laughs> one of the folks who got was involved in it was uh, William William Wardrop. Uh, did a lot of the work of it as Adam well. Nemo. Yeah, Bill Wardrop. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Oh yeah, but yeah, it's it's. Uh, I can't. Rem- I, I don't remember if if it's fifties space or if it's or if it's modern space uh, that is when you land on mars you don't you know, do you need to wear a space suit right i'm pretty sure you. you did i think he was he was trying to be fairly science true yeah you know except for the weird things that he was doing like you know how he how the spaceship worked and and stuff like that uh but i mean mm-hmm. other than that i think he was trying to so he was basically <laughs> trying to have a pulpish science fiction inside of a fairly realistic universe yeah right right yeah. and then we had uh we had he had cloisters which we we talked about on the podcast um that was yeah. the i'm trying to remember that was the one with the, the head like oh, it's ultimate, apocalyptic. Apocalyptic. Yeah, it, it's, it's basically a kendico for leibowitz okay it's yeah 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 Take, all, and it's all set in michigan yep okay. yeah yes of course of course it is <laughs> I mean, well, it's, it's as good as any other place. Sure, why not? I got it. Yep. And, and then that is read the blurb from the from the website. You have chosen the hard path of knowledge, and are actively working to end the new era of ignorance and superstition. You are a monk in the order of Saint James the Literate. Your mission <laughs> is to collect and d- disseminate knowledge to teach and help the people who are left. Welcome to the harsh realities of twenty second century America. <laughs> And then here's here's the funny one though, uh, murder hoof. Yes. Uh, ah which, yes. Which Mike, you would like this one. It's it's a, yeah. a it's kind of a My Little Pony game. Hey. Sort of. Hey. It's reminiscent. It's your kind of game. No. Yeah. No, not so much. Yeah. Yeah. 
No. Yeah, a- except except they're actually evil fucking centaurs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they just they, they just have this one they have this wonderful glamour around them. Yeah. I think that's the first time I've ever heard Bruce drop the F bomb in the fifteen years I've known. Oh my god. <laughs> Brad, you you are correct. Yeah. Oh wow, wow. But I think uh, you're right because I remember talking about that, and I was like, oh, "Oh, they're the bad guys." Yeah. And if you yeah. don't, if you don't want to play the game, you can buy the miniatures. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh he, yeah. There's a lot of miniatures. And John, you're, uh, yeah, you're a big old brony. The miniatures, I believe, are all done by a, actually a friend of mine, Andy Barlow, for. Mm-hmm. Dark Platypus Gaming, I believe the name of his, yep. his company. But yeah, he's also done the Bureau 13 miniatures that have come out recently. Yep. And oh no, Andy, fantastic work. I mean, just, yeah. uh, just the name of few. There's Trailer Trash Fairies. <laughs> yep. Kim <laughs> Jong Il. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, you know that that says something really i mean let's get back getting back to like you know not just talking about the stuff that rich created but like talking about rich the man himself i mean it just this all goes back to this personality this playful personality that we've been talking about you know he mm-hmm. does he's done serious stuff you know fringe worthy was was a very serious game but when you look through the book i mean there's plenty of comedy and like lightheartedness that you see in it mm-hmm. you know it it's sort of like there's a lot of dark humor he's really good at the dark humor um, you know, and I, because I'm a fan of Terry Pratchett, who's passed away as well a couple of years ago. But I would say his humor is in, the, in sort of like with Terry Pratchett. It's people are involved in a serious situation, and to them, is deadly serious. Right. But from uh, us on the outside, it's hilarious. Like I would equate it. I would equate it to like I bet he. I bet. I bet he was a fan of like Ash. The you know the whole Evil Dead series. Mm-hmm. It wouldn't surprise me a bit if he wasn't a fan of that. Yes, he was. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I figured. I figured as much. So, what, are we um, really going? Are we really going to start about Rich's taste in movies? Are sure we not. going to go down that? Are we going to go around that barbecue a few times? Uncle Richard's trash cinema. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> no. So okay, tell me, okay. what is that? Is what is that about? Okay, this is stuff. Late nights at at cons, he would just host. These incredibly, I mean, this was MST3K without the riffing before MST3K. I've got three words that to this day just make various parts of me twitch. Turkish Star Wars. Oh, yeah, I remember Uh, that. He sat me down and had what? Now, apparently Turkey has different copyright laws than the United States do. So you had... You know, the ship scenes were the Millennium Falcon, TIE Fighters, and all this. And they may put a, a TIE Fighter in, and it was just, you know, we didn't see it as a TIE Fighter. It was just a starship, and they used that clip. The actors were all in bad 70s sparkly sci-fi jumpsuits, bad lightsaber battles, um, you know, like in, you know, in the rocky areas of Turkey, you know, like the Taurus Mountains. And just, I'm watching this, and it's like 11 o'clock on a Friday night at the con. And I'm just looking at Rich like, this is an abomination. And he's like, well, yeah, they, they're copyright. And I'm just looking at him, shaking my head, going. And, and it was this was after he did those, but he still had all these movies there. I I kind of came in on the tail end of him doing this at the local cons. But yeah, Turkish Star Wars just oh. So I just I wanna I wanna point out like so just I have this copy of Fringe Word. This is this is the copy we played with most. I mean, we had we had the comb bound, but then when this one came out, we yeah. we played oh, with the this 92. version. Oh, the ninety two, yeah, yeah, okay, nineteen ninety two. So this, yeah. this is the one Third we edition. played. We kind of we kind of played until the, the the wheels came off. Um, so he would start out. You know, he would have he would have like these crazy looking Mellers, which which were no joke. I mean, they would just tear you up and, and rip you. Doug to Blanchard. Doug Blanchard's the artist. Yeah. And. So, so we'd have serious stuff like that, but then in the same book, you know, a couple pages later, you know, you have, you know, you have a picture like this, which looks like the something out of Mad Mag. <laughs> looks yeah. like something out of Mad Magazine. And then, hold on, wait, wait. And then there's, you know, and then and here's oh. one about the def- here's a picture for deflection, you know. <laughs> Again, another <laughs> Mad Magazine picture, right? 
I um, use that one in Bureau 13, and I think also use that one in Fringe Worthy as in FTL maybe. And then, <laughs> and then my favorite picture of his. This is the most iconic, as, as far as I'm concerned, at least with our group, the most iconic Fringe Worthy picture of all time is Ed Powers. It's Miller uh, time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so oh, actually, I think what I, 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 my players would say would be iconic one for the French Worthy really game was the guy changing tires in the French path and watching his spare tire go bounce, bounce, bounce. Bing! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. so it's just it's just you know it was just it's a very the french way is a very serious game it's very hard sci-fi very you know it it's it's a it's a pretty mm -hmm. hardcore game and you can die really fast in it with that with richest system the the, the tri tac system yeah. um it was intentionally I, made that that lethal because he wanted people to do good things and mm -hmm. not run around not run and gun like crazy because right. yeah mm -hmm. if you're if you're invulnerable then yeah, you can run around and do whatever you want to. But his system gave consequences. If you if you got into combat, somebody was going to die. Could be you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and if you were early GM and you were were faulting your players for killing things, they'd turn around and say, "No, no, no. You put us in a situation where we only had one choice." And as an early GM, going, "Oh, I did, didn't I?" Yeah. Well, the, and and the thing is, with these hit location charts, they were like. The god and devil of role playing. I heard everybody go, "Oh my gosh, these hit location charts are so detailed. You could you have death shock if you got hit in the pinky, which was like three percent, right?" But yeah, they're sitting there going, "Oh my god, those hit location charts were just horrendous." So it was sort of a god and devil thing. Yeah, I mean, it's pages That's long in this book. Like it starts yeah, yeah. like yes. like it like it starts here, right? And then it goes, you know, one, two, <laughs> three. Yeah. Four, like like well, four or five we, pages front and back. That's when the project we did. Yeah, that's, we did in with was it over, <laughs> was it uh, Terror Watch or was it in um, Infants Crossroad? We did the one page. The, the one page. We tried to do a one page. I actually, have two page, one printed sheet. It was it. It was in Terror Watch, and it was improved and published also in Infinite Crossroads. Yeah, basically, we, we, took, we I sat down and did the numbers, and condensed it down into basically a one page print on both sides. Right, it's right. the same charts, just that you don't have to sit there and leaf through a bunch of things. But but to go back to, to Rich, you know, being a you know being a good guy, you know, like you said, he wanted characters to be good guys. Um, you know, experience was earned in that game, in Fringeworthy at least. You earned experience by doing good things. Like you could you would actually if you were in a situation, I can't remember exactly how this worked, but you'd get a lot of experience points if you were put into a situation where you could have gunned your way out, but you didn't. Like you talked right. your way out or you did something. Yeah. You yes. would get a lot, a lot more experience points for doing that. Like, yeah, he wasn't basically like, unlike, unlike D and D, right? Yeah, unlike D and D, you didn't yeah. get, you know, oh, you killed a dragon, you get a million experience points. It was like, oh, you, you know, you saved, you know, or you, not you saved, but you managed to not kill this majestic creature. You get a hundred thousand experience points. You killed it, oh, you get two hundred fifty. But it was really hard yeah. to kill. It's like, yeah, but you killed it. <laughs> you know, you could have not and killed you, it, and you, and you didn't have to. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. So it, yeah, it was I mean, cool. There were times when there were times you in the game you have to kill things, okay? And he got experience for it. But if you could find a way of not killing it, or found a way of bringing peace, or or mitigating the circumstances, uh, you know, then you got more, which makes sense because that means you were using your brain instead of your twit your finger twitch, you know. Yeah. 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 So that, that's he was rewarding people for intelligent, creative play. Yeah. He was basically he he because he, st he still had you know lethal combat, but he basically this is actually a style of Japan called Hanaboro, which is uh, translates to pastoral games, where the emphasis is more on talking to people and socializing than it is about sticking a sword up the up the goblin's butt. butt you know. <laughs> Right, right. You know, and, and basically his games, you know, you get the most points for helping people. Uh, not so many points. Well, except in those course, you infringe worthy, you get you get lots of points for killing Meller. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. they were because they were evil bastards. But you know what? But ever since he released that the, there are actually cures, I would say I would add in, and if you can cure Meller, here's how many, how many experience points you get. Because it's yeah. gonna be damn hard to cure Meller. Well, yeah. <laughs> and and so 
<laughs> so there was a lot of secrets that came out during the TriTech podcast because he'd given us permission to like start mm-hmm. letting these secrets out. And and that's that's uh, completely thanks to Bruce because Bruce was twisting his arm and saying, look, you got to let this stuff out. It's been 30 years. Let's start yeah, telling exactly. some of these secrets. You was like, say, what are you on. holding on to this for? <laughs> right. right. Well, so like, like the fringe train what? was one of them. Uh, yeah. You know, there was the, the 88, was it 88 miles per hour, Bruce? What is it? 80 miles per hour? That you go through the portal at a certain speed, you become fringe worthy. Oh, um, it's it's a see. I I have a different number than Richard was has quoted recently. It's around 150 miles an hour. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. wow. Okay. Yeah. And it's then it basically was, a number that you would not ease, you would not easily reach. You know, right. and and so it would probably happen mostly by accident. Yeah. Right. Wait a minute. Let me, okay. Well, let me get this straight. This is this is something I always say on the on the podcast. I've been with the company 10-ish years, and I'm still learning new stuff. Let me get this straight. You can induce fringeworthiness by going through the portal if you're non-fringeworthy at a relatively high rate of speed. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. No, he was inspired by a series of novels whose names I can't remember because I read them too, though, which was basically truckers going to between, between the stars. And they would drive between these gates of ro- rotating neutronium and had to go a certain speed. Otherwise, you, you end up being, well, smeared across those spheres of neutronium. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and you would transit and you would end up in another, another place. And it was a wonderful series. And Richard read that. And that's where he got the idea of, he was, actually, that was a supplement. He, we were talking about supplements he was planning to do fringe trucker. Mm. Yeah. But the, that was know, an the, idea, idea of his. There are other well, things. That, that's the possible ending to the uh, new, uh, yeah. you know, uh, Portals to, 4. Yeah. Portals 4. Yeah. Yeah. But but that's you know there's a lot of things. Like, was there was there stuff in Bureau Thirteen that he never let out that that uh, what happened that you, to the Bureau in seventy right? seven? <laughs> oh, does no, anybody? No, yeah. no, no. He let we we figured it out. We we come up with a definitive answer, and Rich basically gave the blessing. So yeah, okay, that's true. Do do and that'll be a future podcast and or supplement. Yeah, there you go. Well, I was gonna say, as, as, yeah. as you guys know it, are there are there any secrets that you know about that you haven't released yet that will that maybe we'll be able to release at now or or mm-hmm. in the future? Maybe you don't have to tell me what they are now, but are, are is it it's a yes or no? I, tr- it's not. I tried to release everything I possibly could. Yeah, okay. uh, it's it really was because as I said, it, it, these these things have been there. Not you know, Richard loves secrets. Richard, you know, was always lo- bringing stuff out, and he'd be like, "Well, how does that work, Richard?" And he'd just smile at you and just walk away. Oh, Jesus and, yeah, Christ! So yeah, that's yeah. Oh, that's, that's part that's as part of his personality. Yeah, and so yeah, he didn't want to release this stuff, but mostly he wasn't. It wasn't like he was trying not to release it. It was just kind of like it never did. So yeah. I, 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 that's why I sat down and basically went through everything and said, I want to understand this. And a lot of it, we actually made up, uh, Trav mm-hmm. and John and I, all during, you know, we sat down and said, well, this is, you know, th- let's let's talk about this and how this w- should be working. And then we came back to Richard and we said, okay, is this how it works? And he says, sure. <laughs> so we're like, so, yeah. yeah. Oh, no. and, the one comment I got, I forgot who it was, was that GM, that Richard was GMing the GM. Right, right. You know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> gotcha, yeah, yeah. yeah. One, one thing what that, go ahead. Well, there's what I wanted to say, when, and Bruce kind of filtered this to us, that Rich considered the four of us, mm-hmm. me, Lex, John, and Bruce, the TriTech Brain Trust. We um, were the ones that all of these new ideas and rich trusted us that much yeah. where he was like, no, I'll go with this because I know they plotted this out. They know the history, you know, mm-hmm. they, I haven't and, implicit faith in them. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it was a better idea. Yeah. Right. So uh, I, I think it, it's, mm-hmm. I think it's, it's fair to say, you know, if, if you were a fan of Rich's stuff and you've never listened to the TriTech podcast, dude, you got to listen to that. There are, how, what episode are you up to now? Do you, do you have any idea, Bruce, where you guys are? Yeah, we're, uh, well, we, we have it um, ready to drop episode uh, 378. 300, there are 378 episodes now and every episode is pretty much, it, 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 you know, it's basically like a, a dragon magazine in a way. It's like a TriTech dragon where, you know, the, when I was with them and when the guy's still doing it, uh, you know, they 
talk about this kind of stuff and go into depth. You know, what does this mean? What does that mean? What is, well, how would you do this? And adventure ideas come out all the time and, you know, like adventure seeds and, um, you know, just like, like particulars and like new ideas and stuff, uh, things. And, and you guys, you do a lot of stuff where you're like, um, you know, you're like, you know, this is not exactly canon, but this would be cool. This would, this would fit. You know, um, oh, yeah. there's well, like, no reason like why concept, this like, like my concept of the dark fringe, basically, it's another. I, I consider it an alternate setting where basically the United States government walks in and says, "Yeah, you're you're now a guest of the United States government." While well, we investigate this, it's right. it's you know, it, technically it's in New Zealand territory, but the United States government, you know, it's got more got more guys with guns. Right. right. <laughs> so you, sh- you should be listening to. It. I mean, Rich's yeah. legacy is going to live on in the, in the podcast. Um, yeah. Now, I, you know, we, we've talked about we talked about this before the show. Uh, nobody knows what's happening. If anybody is curious as to well, what does this mean for TriTech, no one knows anything yet. And, you know, nope. there's you know, it's way too early for anyone to say, yeah. have, have yeah. any idea. And this is not you know, it's 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 not any kind of, um, you know, cop out. And nobody knows yet. It's, it's really early on. So, uh, you know, yep. we'll know something soon. And I'm sure, Mel, uh, you know, Melly will make a. Um, Announcement, announcement about it at some point. Yeah. At some yeah. point. So just, yeah. just watch TriTech. Um, maybe she'll release it yeah. through the podcast or something. Who knows? Yeah. And um, talking about things like, you know, cause like, um, hello person back there. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Roommate just came home. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, like with FTL 24, eight, uh, during the, uh, not the, cause there's a lot of influx. A lot of the things you see in FTL 24, 48 were from the playtest groups. He had like three, uh, and also some work we did after, after this first release, uh, basically the two book version, I, you know, basically he had a lot of folks writing. I, I wrote a lot of stuff for uh, several sections in that book myself. I actually wrote a section on trade. I, I disliked the, the traveler trade system. So I wrote a trade system. I looked at now, I look at nowadays and go, it's a piece of shit. <laughs> 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 because basically I've come to the re- realization that y- if you give people money, they break out the account, they break out the accounting tools, they break out the spreadsheets and they start working it. And anyone could easily take my system and end up making millions of dollars in game right. money, you know, just by playing it. So basically I'm in the opinion of the, of the way a lot of fake games do, which is you're poor. Right. Make a roll. Do you, does it work? No. Okay, you're more poor now. <laughs> All right. All right. Hey, so, so guys, we're we're up on time. So, I want to give everybody an opportunity to have you know one last, um, mm. you know, get one last bit of, of whatever uh, they want to say about you know about Rich and his life and his legacy. Uh, mm. And and if if it's okay, I'm just gonna go left to right. So Bruce is on my far left. So Bruce, um, what you know, is there anything you want to say before we uh, finish the show up? Well, I think that the thing that Richard did more than anything else was he made games that were fun to play. And they he wasn't shy about reaching out to anybody. He was very inclusive. Uh, I mean, if you look at his the characters in his games, you know, they were all from all different races, all different walks of life. You know, I mean, sometimes they were they were, you know, kind of funny aliens, but Every single one of them, he tried to imbue with his own sense of personhood, and he wanted that on the players themselves. And he had a great deal of faith in humanity, not only in in our future, but also in the ability of people to to orb and and and, and take his games which had flaws and turned them into something wonderful and in, and i would say that he was very successful in that he I think he proved his point many many times okay okay and john well i mean I, I, since I, i've known richard the longest i mean uh, he, he basically uh, he showed me that anyone could be a game designer i mean uh look i i helped on a bunch of games i helped produce two games I'm working on a third and you know, depending on what happens in the future, that damn thing's coming out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, he, I mean, I just remember my early days of gaming with Richard and how sometimes us players could just get that, get the Richard look, you know, the Richard look, don't you Trav? When mm-hmm. the players do something amazing and he just gets that, you know, oh, that, yeah. si- that <laughs> sideways, <laughs> That sideways look, you know, like when we, you know, we're a bunch of D&D players in Dresden during the firebombing. So two of us, we did a pitch perfect 
air raid siren. <laughs> <laughs> we had the two tones going perfectly, and it was just like, oh my god. <laughs> And that got the Richard look, but yeah, it, but he also was a creative person. I mean, this is a you know, I wish I was half as created, creative as Richard has been, and it's as successful as getting his ideas out the door. I mean, I, I, I can show you a pile of games I've designed that never got very far, and but yeah, I've worked on them though. That's the thing is, and I keep refining them, and I keep working on them, and hopefully. I'll get, I'll have one of my own games out there beside, you know, and not, uh, you know, but I would look at Richard as being my inspiration though for those games. Okay. All right. And then uh, I, I'm going to go, I'm going to go, uh, let me go Mike next. Now, Mike, you didn't really know Richard, but he, he did affect you. How did, how did Richard's existence on this planet affect your life? I, I would definitely <laughs> say that uh, he, he introduced me uh, to one of the best games I've ever played, which was uh, Fringeworthy. I mean, the I know even even playing the that system and just incorporating Fringeworthy in just about any and everything we ever played after that uh, was just uh, it's not it's not gaming if Fringeworthy isn't in some way, shape, or form like uh, you know involved in our games, yeah. and and it'll always be like that for us. I just I mean for me I just. You know, thank you, Richard, for wherever you are. Thank you. Yeah. All right. And Trav? All right. Richard Taholka was a man of intellect, heart, wit, charm, whimsy, creativity. And as I posted on, on my own Facebook, he gave this goofy fanboy a chance to live his dream. I'm going to do my damnedest to repay that debt in whatever capacity Tritac will allow. He has the biggest family on the planet. And there are people all over this planet because Rich would, I mean, somebody would write him, oh, my son's in Afghanistan or Iraq and he played your games. On his own dime, he sent boxes of games to people, soldiers Ooh. out in the field and they're holding these books up. And I've seen the pictures. Oh, that's cool. And just the heart that he had was incredible. And another thing that, that Bruce and John and I know Rich for is his tenacity. Man could dig his heels in like nobody's business. I mean, the whole <laughs> building the planter story, people still look at me like, he did what after what? And just, I'm like, yeah, we hey, role-playing hey, designers are a tenacious lot. Hey, hey, that's why the Chileans are still around, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, Plus, he will always be Uncle Rich. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. All right. And then uh, I'm gonna give the I'm gonna give the last last thought on this. Um, just that you know I I loved Rich's creations. Uh, and he was a good guy. You know, and he he was very nice. He was very generous to me. Uh, and, you know, just just in his 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 um, the way he spoke to me. Um, you know, he was just happy. He's like, oh, you're a fan, and boom, and he just you know he would just draw you in. Um, and, and, you know, and like you guys have alluded to, you know, his, his mechanics weren't always the greatest. Um, th they were what they were, uh, but his, his ideas were fantastic. I mean, really fantastic. You know, uh, Fringeworthy came out and, and if you're not familiar with, if you're listening to this for the first time, you're like, I, you know, this is really cool. It sounds really cool. When you look at the portals and what they do and the way they work, um, you know, there's a, there's a property out there and I, I think, you know, we can say it, you know, it, it, it Stargate is very similar to what Fringeworthy was or, or is. And, um, a person might, a person might make connections, but Fringeworthy came out way before Stargate did. Um, you know, so, so whether that was an inspiration or not, I, I have no legal say in that, but <laughs> some people we have may. No legal we have no legal opinions on the. Right, on we have, I have, this is this is just my <laughs> personal opinion. Uh, and then, controversy. Right, <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, and then you know, in Bureau Thirteen and Stalking the Night, Fantastic, or the same thing. I mean, what is the name of that game? Is it Bureau Thirteen or Stalking the Night, Fantastic? Bureau Thirteen, it, Stalking the Night, Fantastic. Oh, so it's both. Well, it's one big long. Stalk, I think it was Stalking the Night, Fantastic first, then Bureau Thirteen, then he put it together. Okay, no, yes. that's, I, that's exactly right. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. So anyway, so that game, that that setting was before Buffy. It was before, uh, you know, Men Ghostbusters. In Black. Before Ghostbusters. Before X Files. Hellboy. 
And yeah. it's, it's all that stuff. All that, I mean, it, it's it's all those things, which is really cool. Yeah. Right. And so, so not to say that, that you know, they would they took those ideas from I'm just saying that he was ahead of his time. Like, he, he didn't have that to build off of. You know, when somebody else builds a game like that today, you know, you can point back and say, oh, yeah, I see. Okay, cool. You're probably influenced by this. Rich wasn't influenced by that stuff. You know, he made it before all, yeah. before there was influence. Well, so about so the was, only influence you would have would have been the real Ghostbusters. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, about that. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Basically, that's a, for those who don't know what I'm talking about. We're not talking about the anime edition of Ghostbusters. No, this is talking, old school. Yeah, we're talking uh, the guy who played uh, Force. The two Tucker. guys from F Troop. Yeah, and, and a guy and a and, 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 Yep, and, and a guy in a gorilla suit. In a gorilla yes, suit. Right, right. Long. So, yes. so at any rate, you know, I just, you know, I just it can't be said enough that Rich, Rich was a, uh, was a creative dude and he's very, very creative. Um, so, and, and he'll be missed, you know, it, it's, yep. it's, it's TriTech is not going to be the same without him. Um, you know, it's my hope and, 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 you know, I really, really hope things will continue to move forward and that, and that the products, his mm-hmm. legacy will carry on, uh, you know, and continue to carry on, not just like still sell mm-hmm. the stuff that already exists, but actually, you know, find, you know, maybe you find gentlemen will be able to like push it forward at some point. Maybe we'll see, we'll see what happens. Uh, like I said, it's too early to know, but, but, you know, it's my wish yeah. that, that someone will take the property mm-hmm. and continue forward mm-hmm. with it. However that yep. happens, yep. um, it would be, it'd be terrible to see it, to, to see it not go anywhere. Yeah. But at any rate, that's all the time we have for this evening. Uh, I'm gonna run the closer now, guys. Thank you for joining me. Um, thank you know this has been a this has been a great um, tribute to Rich. You know, I I think he would have really liked this. I think this is this is exactly the, the kind of empty. thing that he would have he would have liked <laughs> to have seen. So uh, so here we go. Uh, you have just enjoyed another awesome episode of the Mythwits Podcast. Join us live on Twitch Mondays at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Jump into the chat room and ask our guests questions like Dave, Morgan, Eric, and Paul McDonald. They were very, very active in the, in the chat room. If you Thanks, miss our guys. live show, you can always catch the Encore episodes at YouTube forward slash Mythwits. Find us at Mythwits.com on Facebook, Twitter, Twitch, SoundCloud, blah, 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 all that stuff as Mythwits. Uh, do the like, follow, subscribe thing wherever it's appropriate. Please give us a bunch of stars and review on iTunes. And hey, I'm going to jump in right here. Go listen to the TriTac podcast. It's fantastic. Um, if you uh, if you do a review for us or or TriTac or either one, screenshot that, post it on our Facebook page, and I will send you something special. Mythwits is part of the TSR Podcast Network. If you like us, you are bound to like the other great shows there as well. Check out TSRPN.com. Mythwits is a Creative Commons product. Make sure to check out Studio 187 for more cool stuff and join our mailing list. Please join our mailing list. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Tell your friends to tune in. And until next week, Mike? All right, guys. It is my mother's birthday in two days. (laughs) And we're all going to sing her. Her name is Mama Marsh. We're all going to sing her happy birthday right now. Here we go. One, two, three. Happy Happy birthday 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 to you. you. Happy birthday birthday to you. you. Legs a bitch. Happy Happy birthday, birthday, dear dear mama. Happy Happy birthday birthday to you. 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 It doesn't work so well with uh, very... (laughs) With lag. Lag. The intertubes. The intertubes. And in some cases, severe lack of talent. Right, yeah. All now, right. Of course, if you were on what? Bureau on, on Bureau Thirteen uh, Network, would be you know, it would be no lag. <laughs> All right, All right everybody. Hey, thanks, hey, Rich. Rest in peace wherever you are, my man. Safe journeys, yeah, and we yes. so long. Mm-hmm.